Okay, I got the top of the hour, Ryan. All right, thank you. So we are continuing our monthly Badger Dairy Insight series today. Again, these are offered the third Tuesday of each month at 11 o'clock Central Time. I do wanna lead off with announcing our April session Put it on your calendars. We're going to be talking about grazing our way to reduce heifer costs and better sustainability with Jason Cavadini and Nesli Akdenes, both outreach specialists with UW Madison and Extension. But with that, we're going to jump right in. We're going to talk about strategies for improving reproduction in dairy herds. I'm going to stop my screen sharing and we're going to talk a little bit with Dr. Paul Fricke, uh, Cal Specialist, Animal and Dairy Science Department at UW Madison. And right across the street from Paul, we have Dr. J.P. Martins with the College of Veterinary Medicine, also Specialist in Dairy Cattle Reproduction at UW Madison. So with that, we're going to turn it over to Paul and J.P. We're going to start off with Paul. Normally at this part of the program, we'd be saying your bios. We're going to let you guys take the lead today <laughs> uh, and share a little bit about your background. Um, and after doing that, we just had the Reproduction Roadshow, a series of, what was it, six, seven in-person meetings, both dairy producers and dairy veterinarian focused uh, in Wisconsin a couple weeks ago. And we're just going to jump in a little bit of recap, some common questions you received on that program. So with that, go for it, JP. Hi, so my name is João Paulo Martins, actually. Uh, people call me JP because it's hard to pronounce my name. So here in the School of Vet Mad, I'm Dr. JP Mar Martins. I, I, would, I was born in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. My parents had a, a 20 cow dairy in Minas Gerais, the Wisconsin state of Brazil. And um, I actually did my DVM in Brazil. Uh, in 2005, I graduated, worked a couple of years as a bovine practitioner in the in this in the country side of the state of Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil, and then I I moved to United States in 2006 to work with Dr. Persley, Richard Persley, as a research a research uh, intern. Uh, worked there for a couple of years, a research intern. Did my master and PhD with him. We focused on reproductive physiology and management of dairy cows. Worked a couple of years at uh, University of California as a um, dairy extension, uh, dairy uh, advisor, extension advisor, and then came here to the School of Veterinary Medicine at UW Medicine uh, in 2018. So I've been uh, as assistant professor in the School of Vet Medicine since 2018. Uh, my research focus is on reproductive physiology and management of dairy cows and heifers. So that's it. I Great. teach veterinary students, by the way. So we had we have a teaching and research and outreach appointment. So, yeah, my turn, Ryan. Go for it. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, the um yeah. So my name is Paul Fricky. I have been in Wisconsin almost thirty years. I came to Wisconsin back in nineteen ninety five to do a postdoc. I did my postdoc with uh, Milo Wiltbank. Uh, and then I had an interim position for a year. And so then in 1998, I took my faculty position here uh, in the Animal and Dairy Sciences Department at UW-Madison. So I've been on faculty for 26, almost 27 years. And uh, Brian, you were one of my early students along the way somewhere, maybe my third, <laughs> third grad student. I won't say how long ago that was, but we're getting older every year. We both and love to tell about it. We both live to talk about it, publish some really fun papers back in those days. Um, yeah, my appointment here in the department is between extension and research. And so my research area, just like JP's, is, is dairy cattle reproduction. I've done work in the areas of non-pregnancy diagnosis, synchronization programs, work with heifers and cows, some nutritional aspects of reproduction, heat detection systems, uh, we, we've looked at a lot of things and now JP and I are actually collaborating on some experiments. We've done that. JP, I've known you for a while. I knew you back when you were a PhD student with Percy because I've been good friends with Richard. When I came here in 1998, actually Percy was here finishing up his PhD with, with Milo Wiltbank and then he went over to Michigan State. So, uh, it's good to have JP on board here at UW Madison adds a lot of strength to our, to our repro program. And so, uh, what we want to get into today, we want to talk, we want to kind of recap our, our road show. And so JP and I had this, we did this, what, last year, right? For the first yes. time? 
first so we time did, last year. Yeah, last year was kind of focused mostly on veterinarians. I think we did mostly veterinary meetings throughout the state. Uh, we had so much fun last year in February. We decided to do it again this year in February. And so I'm going to share my screen uh, real quick. I think this is it here. Uh, share. Yeah, there. Ryan, can you see that? Yep, we can see that. All right. So let me let me get my pointer up here. So uh, what we did is, of course, JP and I. This is another little trivia. JP and I live right around the corner from each other up in Wanakee, Wisconsin. So, so JP's my neighbor. Not only my neighbor on campus, but my neighbor off campus. So we started in Wanakee uh, Monday morning, drove down to Darlington, Wisconsin, where Jackie is, and did a meeting down there for farmers. And uh, that was a great kickoff. There was a couple of veterinarians there that we know too. It was really, really good group down there. And so we did that meeting. And then after that meeting, the same day, Monday, we took this trek all the way up through La Crosse where we switched over. We actually did some driving in Minnesota, which I guess you can't, you can't avoid, you know, driving in Minnesota when you head up to, to River Beautiful Falls. scenery, actually. Oh my gosh. It was, it was beautiful, beautiful day, beautiful weather. Then we went up here and we uh, spent the night in River Falls and then had the meeting there at River Falls with, uh, with Ryan. And that was a good group as well. Uh, JP, we pulled into the, um, we knew it was at the, um, at the research part where the farm was, but we dr drove in the farm. We had no idea where the meeting was going to be. So we just had to kind of like follow the cars and we finally, finally made it over there, but that was a good group uh, that we had up there. So that would have been Tuesday. And then um, Tuesday, we, after that meeting, we drove over to Edgar, Wisconsin little little berg there in north central wisconsin and did did a uh, veterinary meeting that night right jp yes so i think we had eight or ten veterinarians there that night a lot of good people that i haven't seen for a long time my friend jill Colton was there so we did that meeting we spent the night in wausau uh and then came back to edgar and did a, a farmer meeting again another kind of fun meeting that we did and there were yeah. a couple of veterinarians at that one too by the way yeah, there were. And then we um, we ended up going over to Green Bay. So this would have been what, Wednesday night? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was Wednesday no. night. Yeah, it uh, was Wednesday, Wednesday morning, right? No, Wednesday... oh, we went down and spent yeah. the night, didn't yeah. we? No. Yeah. Well, we went to, you know, we actually we actually did a tour of of Lambeau Stadium. Yeah. Is that fantastic? So JP, uh, of course. He I thinks football, he thinks football is played with a round ball with the spots on it, you know, and we had to go, no, 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 no. Football is played with an oblong ball at Lambeau field. Right. So that was a great tour. Wasn't it JP? Oh, amazing. I, I don't understand why nobody told me about this tour before, because this is actually a fantastic tour and it's not that it's cheap in my opinion. So we spent about a couple hours yeah, it was getting to know yep. every inch of that. Uh, <laughs> we actually even walked, in the in on the on the field so that was perfect yeah it was amazing it was great and that veterinary meeting that we had up there in green bay i think we, we're going to come back to that and talk a little bit really a good group of veterinarians in that part of the state of course we have a lot of cows in that part of the state a lot of veterinarians up there so a number of different veterinarians that i've known for a long time and some new ones actually jp that have come through the vet school were up there so that was a really great meeting then um the next morning uh, I guess that was Thursday morning. We drove down to the farm, uh, Wisconsin Discovery Center. Probably our biggest group over there. Yeah, would you say? It was maybe a tough not group, though. But it was, it was a, yeah, it was a tough group. We had a good we had a good meeting over there, and then uh, then we drove back to Wanakee, back home, spent the night, and then we had our Wanakee meeting, which is actually another really good meeting. We've had some good meetings over the years at Wanakee. They know us really well there, so they give us a hard time, and and then, so that that's what the um, that's what our uh, road show uh, looked like. And I wanted to start off, Ryan, and just kind of recap. I can start and then JP can talk a little bit about uh, what he talked about. So really, the one of the things that I've been working on a lot in my lab with my students has been optimizing use of sex semen 
in lactating dairy cows and non-lactating heifers. And so um, I had a number of different topics that I did um, with the group. I started kind of talking a little bit about heifers. We've got an interesting, uh, you know, concept as far as growing heifers. I think, um, Ryan, you can check me on this, but I think a lot of people are trying to calve heifers earlier and earlier because the biggest cost with raising heifers is days on feed. And of course, days on feed is determined by um, when those heifers get pregnant. So if you can push that age at pregnancy or age at first calving down, theoretically, you can save a lot of money on days on feed. But what we kind of show is there's a relationship there. If they're too young, if they're not hitting their percent mature body weight recommendations, um, you're going to compromise milk production in those heifers. And so I was just, I just did a talk, some talks last week or the week before over in Poland, which is the opposite problem over there. They're calving heifers at 27, 28 months. But here in the U.S., and JP, you can comment on this too. I think we just see a lot of people trying to push that age at first calving down. You're muted, JP. You're muted. Sorry JP. about there that. I I was coughing, so I stopped it. Um, I muted myself. So, yeah, a lot of people are trying to push it hard on that. Um, as early as I bet, I would say a year old. I think that would be even some people that have tried that eleven month, and that can have some effects on later on on production. So. Yeah, most people would would start breeding heifers with with age, right, Paul? So yep. we are trying to see, um, and Paul have really good data on this about um, a mature body weight. So we are we are trying to understand a little bit more what is the most optimal time to um, to start breeding the heifers and to not have an effect later on on fertility and in on half of those those uh, first lactating cows and also to try to reduce the time that these cows are, are, are bred so basically make sure they are bred as early as possible but without any later later on effects so it's it's a battle because i think most people want to do that most producers wanted to reduce that but you can have these effect later on so it's it's we're trying to find what is the best what is the best variable that we could use um is it age it is body body weight and i believe we can probably try to use both um to reduce per, at least a percentage of of the heifers that we can breed a little bit early on the the ones that grow faster maybe we can actually start breeding them earlier uh, but the ones that uh, take more time to to grow, then you would have to wait them to get in the correct mature body weight, um, and then we can breed them on the right uh, mature time. I would say. So, right, Paul. I yeah. think in Poland, I think the problem is that maybe it's the mo most of these these uh, have also nutrition problems too. Like in Brazil, it takes a lot of time because of the genetics and nutrition. Here we have a really good. I think most farms are. Uh, have optimal nutrition for heifers. Sometimes heifers are actually even, I, I'm saying at least at least they get to a, a certain body size in the correct, uh, in the correct time. Uh, but um, they may, in Poland and Brazil, they may too, take too long to get there. Yeah. Oh, I think too, there's just, there's less aggressive. And one of the, one of the messages we were trying to get across in our talks, JP, is just that we have come so far with fertility and lactating dairy cows. We've seen very high preg rates as a result of a couple things, probably implementation of aggressive breeding strategies, fertility programs, but also this concept of what we call the high fertility cycle. That is that if you can get cows pregnant quickly at the end of the voluntary waiting period, they don't spend a lot of time in late lactation getting fat. And if you don't calve fat cows, if you calve cows that are lower body condition, they tend not to lose body condition score post calving. They have higher fertility to these fertility programs and to estrus, and um, they're healthier. Um, they have better fertility. They have less periparturian uh, disease problems, and then they come back around and they're not too fat. And so, but uh, despite the fact that we've really paid a lot of attention to these lactating dairy cows, I think the dairy heifer is is a production side of the equation that just really people don't pay a lot of attention to. 
So, you know, we said that getting, getting a heifer pregnant determines her days on feed. We want to do that aggressively, but I think the message is you want to make sure that they have at least the right age or if not the right uh, percent mature body weight. So some of the things that I was talking about is number one, you have to establish some percent mature body weight of the animals in your herd. And to do that, you got to weigh uh, third and fourth plus lactation cows, to, uh, you know, because everybody has different size cows. Once you know your percent mature body weight in your herd, the breeding target, they're going to, they're going to reach puberty about 45% of mature body weight. And then you want to breed them at 55% of mature body weight. And you want them to calve at 85% mature body weight. That's a post calving, post calving body weight, like at 30 days of milk. So those are, you know, I think, I think we need to start paying attention to those, um, those benchmarks, uh, and raising, raising those heifers. Yeah. I talked a little bit about sex semen. Um, but you know, one thing that's important too, Paul, after they get to that perfect size, yep, like you're saying, there's a huge variability on when they get pregnant because Absolutely. most producers are, are, are using uh reproductive management management strategies that have to wait to to get, detect those animals in estrus so uh or it takes time to get to get them in estrus to find them in estrus if you're not using a, uh, an effective um system for detecting them in estrus and then a lot of them are not even using or any uh pharmacological uh intervention like prostaglandin or grh or any of those programs to get them inseminated in a faster manner so when, when they reach that that uh, mature body weight or age that's optimal for for actually getting them pregnant then you have to have a race to get them pregnant as fast as you can to reduce that days on feed right yep. and that's kind of like what we are trying to implement to to make sure when we get them in the right in the right age or right body a uh, mature body size then get them pregnant as soon as possible aggressive most aggressive very management. Aggr aggressive breeding breeding uh, strategy here and there are ser several uh programs protocols time day protocols or even strategies that you can use to get them as fast as you can so that in that interval from getting them in an eligible in a legible time until uh getting them pregnant needs to be as short as possible so and what people are trying to do is reduce that age instead of reducing the the time period that to get them pregnant and that's the key in my opinion uh to get that those heifers pregnant as soon as possible when they achieve the right the right time right paul exactly and that's you know what you hit upon there jp is kind of the second half so I think we would both advocate that we want to um, we want to grow these heifers aggressively so they hit the appropriate percent mature body weight. But once they get there, be aggressive. And so let me just show I'm going to throw up on the screen here real quick. Um, so this is a protocol um, that would be considered the um, let's see if I can get my pointer up here. All right, so this is kind of the protocol that um, most of you are familiar with what's called the Dairy Cattle Reproduction Council. If you Google Dairy Cattle Reproduction Council, you can go to the website. JP and I have both been involved with that organization over the years. Really a good source for um, information on reproduction. And so you can get a lot of information there. One thing you can get are these uh, synchronization protocols. And this protocol here, this is called a five-day cedar sink protocol. I think JP, probably the, the standard protocol that we think of that's the most recommended protocol out there right now, wouldn't you say? Yes, yes, yeah. And this is probably the most used and most tested protocol. Exactly, um, in heifers. In, in heifers, for in dairy heifers. heifers, yeah. Yeah, so the way this protocol works is that you, and actually this was a beef heifer protocol that, yeah. <laughs> that Bill Day had, or that uh, Mike Day had worked out at, at Ohio State University. Basically, this was borrowed into the dairy side. I mean, dairy and beef heifers are very similar from a physiologic standpoint. But here's, here's what you do. You start, and you don't have to start on a certain day of the cycle with this particular protocol. You just administer GnRH, and you put in a progesterone insert. In the U.S., we use the cedar. That cedar stays in until day five. 
and you pull that cedar on day five and administer prostaglandin. And then day six, the very next day, you give a second prostaglandin treatment. And then two days later on day eight, we do what's called a co-sync. Now this can be a little confusing. We've said for a long time, JP, you don't wanna do co-syncs in our cow protocols, but this protocol, and, and I'll just throw this out there, JP, we're not gonna tell them all of our secrets at this point, but you have a student and I have a student, we think we can make this protocol better. Uh, it's kind of, it works, but it works in a kind of a sloppy way. Um, so you give GNRH and you breed these heifers. Now the problem with this protocol is you get about 27 to 33% of the heifers that will show an estrus a day early. And so what most people will do is they'll tail chalk those heifers uh, either at this prostaglandin or this prostaglandin. You would expect about a third of them to have rub tail chalk and you would go ahead and breed those heifers, especially like if you're using sex semen. And then the rest of them get to the end and do a, a time to eye protocol. And really with this kind of a protocol, we can get fertility similar to what we would see with breeding these heifers to estrus. And so I just wanted to outline, you know, my benchmark for heifers bred to estrus. This would be Holstein heifers inseminated to estrus with conventional semen. You're going to see fertility somewhere in the 60, 65% range. If you put them on this protocol, you're going to see very similar fertility. Um, so we ended up in one of the things that I showed, just like JP was talking about, I'll go ahead and stop this share. Yeah. One of this, the things... this, this, this protocol, I think like, like Paul was saying, I think most of the studies get to between 55 and 65, right? Paul, I would say that's about right. Kind of like yep. for a conventional semen conventional with conventional semen. semen. Yeah. And so, so JP actually has a PhD student, Iago, that's been doing a lot of work to modify this protocol, some really interesting stuff. I've got a PhD student and Iago and Whitney are working together kind of on a project now that we've got going to, to try to modify this thing, which we're not going to talk about now. But one of the things that we did uh, that I showed is in order to prevent those heifers from coming in a day early, we just tried pulling the in the cedar a day later, 24 hours later. So we left it into the second prostaglandin rather than the first one. And that will get rid of that early estrus. When we did that with conventional semen, there was no effect on fertility. So with conventional semen, we can modify the protocol to get rid of the early estrus. We've got 100% time to eye protocol. When we tried doing that with sex semen, we actually saw lower fertility uh, by leaving that cedar insert an extra day. So we, in the same way, we got rid of the early estrus, but with sex semen, we decreased fertility by about seven percentage points. It was 52% or so. If I just look at my slide. It was 52% in the five-day cedar sink protocol. It was 45% in the six-day protocol. And then when you do once daily estrus detection, that was our control group, it was about 45%. It was still 7% lower. And so I guess one of the big messages that I had in my talk, JP, was I think that farmers are trying to use sex semen in the same way they use conventional semen. And if you're doing once daily walk and chalk programs with heifers with conventional semen, that can yield good conception rates. But if you try to do that with sex semen, you're going to have lower fertility. And I talked to a lot of vets out there that are struggling with heifer programs with mid 40% conception rates to sex semen. JP, I think that's one of the problems that we, we have with that. Yeah, exactly. Um, here, just receive, a, and uh, we received a question. Can oh, good. you comment on yeah. using MGA to sink heifers? It oh, yeah. seems much lower labor. Also comment on just giving PGF shots per periodically and watch for heats. Um, well, for for the PGF shots periodically, watch for heats. If you have a heat a heat detection problem, then it becomes uh, a little bit as a as a problem too, right? Because you're just giving prostaglandin and watching for heats. If you have a good system for detect, and a lot of producers that I know, uh, not a lot, but several producers that I know, have issues with heat detection in in halfers. So in this case, or they have to use maybe a a uh, automatic automated um, 
heat detection or activity monitor to check for heats, or they would use a timed AI program like Paul is showing. Uh, maybe they will will miss that that heat, right, Paul? On that, or if they want to only do for that day, then it's it's uh, it's fine. If they yeah. want to do just check for that a particular day, uh, one day after the the last processing learning of the of Let the. Let, let me jump in here real quick on this and then we can move and you can comment on the MGA program because I think that's a really great question. And so Jim asked this question. It's a really good one. Um, in an experiment that we did, our control group was just give prostaglandin and watch for heat. Okay, so when, heifers, yeah, when the time. heifers get moved into the breeding pen, they get prostaglandin and watch them for heat. It's a very common program. We compared that to putting them on one of these timed AI programs right up front. And when we did the five day cedar sink program, um, what you do, so here's the kicker, you incur more cost with a more expensive protocol. Our cost per pregnancy of the five day cedar sink program was $22.29, which sounds high, right? The cost for prostaglandins and watching for estrus was $4.05 per pregnancy, so much cheaper. But what most farmers don't think about or don't calculate is the savings in days on feed. So on average, we got the heifers inseminated 10 days earlier in the five-day cedar sink program, and we got them pregnant on average eight days sooner. The difference in those eight days on feed was a difference between uh, $50 in feed costs for the cedar group, $82 for the estrus group. So the question was, what if we just keep giving prostaglandins and watching for heat? That's what we've done for a long time you eat up a lot of days on feed by not getting those heifers pregnant quickly. And so in our study, the advantage for the five-day cedar sink program was $16.66 per pregnancy advantage to the five-day cedar sink program. And that pays for the cost of the protocol. So I guess what I'm saying to Jim on this question, which is a really good one, there are hidden costs that people don't calculate. Everybody calculates that, that upfront cost of, the, of these programs. But the savings in days on feed overwhelms that. So the concepts of being aggressive with cows and the things that we've done to improve repro really carry over to the heifers. If you're it's more aggressive similar. with that, it's very similar. If you're more aggressive with the heifers, there's a lot of money. I guess what we were saying at, at the meetings, JP, there's a lot of money left on the table with inefficient heifer rearing and breeding programs. And well, and the problem is that you can see the cost of using the hormones right away, but the cost of raising the heifers and those extra days on feed, it's not easy to see, right, Paul? It's yeah, you don't see those. Are, it's a classic hidden cost. It's a hidden cost. So it's the not, opportunity cost, I guess, is what an economics person would call it. Exactly. So that's that's and with with the prostaglandin shot periodically, you also uh, would have to. Uh, although you're going to have an increased management on that short period of time with the sync program, you, you would actually probably get rid of a lot of heifers in just one time. You breed one time and most uh, at 55 to 60 percent of them, 65 percent would be pregnant right away. It's kind of like the same concept with the cows. And then you don't have yeah. to worry of watching them in heat. Right. So in this in this other case, you would have to keep watching them in heat to see which ones are going to come back, and it's a constant battle there. Um, for getting, I want to get the shots, and I want to hit this. We got one more question here, and then we'll bounce back up to that MGA program because JP, you did a little bit of that. So, what's the optimum time of insemination in heifers uh, in natural estrus? Um, you know, so we want to breed heifers. Um, about eight to eight to ten hours before they ovulate, and we know that from the first standing event of estrus to ovulation is about twenty eight hours. And so, you know, once daily breeding programs where you just tail chalk the heifers, show up once a day, uh, watch the rub tail chalks, breed those heifers with conventional semen works really well. Okay, because I think the sperm has a, a long time in the female reproductive tract. The conventional semen longer lifespan in the female reproductive tract than I think most we would, yeah. we would think. And, and it's important to understand that conventional semen didn't have the same processing. Uh, yeah. So there, during that sorting, sorting um, of the sex semen, there's a lot of time that's spent and also mm -hmm. uh, the processing of it, it, it kind of like 
get this semen, uh, this 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 cell, this spermatozoa, this sperm cell, not as um, as um, what 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 we would say, Paul. Um, it uh, beats competent. it up. It comp it it's not it a competent. It doesn't survive as long in the reproductive, the female reproductive tract as yep. the the conventional semen. Yep. And remember, this semen is going to be free, frozen, and thaw, and that so also you kill half of them. It's it's you know it, it, it's yeah. a process there. So that that needs to be. And we expect Paul has really good data on this. About eighty to eighty five percent, right, Paul, of, of the, the fertility. fertility with the convention. So the sex gets to 80 to 85% of the fertility con conception rates uh, of the of the conventional one. And of yep. course, that duration, the survivability of that semen in the tract is not as long as a, as a conventional sp sperm cell. So yep. go ahead, sorry. Paul. So yeah, Furkin just was asking optimal insemination in heifers. So once daily tail chalking systems with conventional semen work fine in heifers, I think if you're going to use sex semen, and, and my PhD student Whitney has some data on this, if you move, if I was using sex semen to breeding to estrus, I would run a list of animals in heat in the morning and breed them, and then come back to that same pen in the afternoon and do the same thing. What that does is decreases the variability in that time. And with sex semen, at least in her data set, it was able to close that gap, um, that, that reduction that we saw infertility. So um, those would be my recommendations. I mean, if you see a heifer in estrus, you can probably just go ahead and breed that heifer. You don't really have to wait. I'm not a big fan of the AMPM breeding programs, but go ahead, Ryan. No, I was just saying long because we ran into one of the meetings and you taught me something that day. Um, yeah. Because sometimes we do uh, use AMPM and twice daily interchangeably. Yeah, they're really not exactly the same thing. They're not exactly. The AMPM rule is that if a heifer's in heat in the morning, you wait till the afternoon to breed her. A heifer in, in heat in the afternoon, you wait till the next morning to breed her. That's the old AMPM rule. The problem with that is that you don't know how long an animal's been in heat when you see her in heat. And so I've argued that the AMPM rule causes you to breed heifers on, on balance too late. If anything, the mistake you're going to meet is make is, is breeding them too late. And so... What I'm talking about is not the AMPM role. It's just twice daily going to the pens, watching the heifers and breeding them. So if, I think with sex semen, you have to do that. Now, now one more thing I'll say, I think if I'm going to use sex semen in heifers, using it based on a timed AI program is a pretty nice way to do it because you control the timing of ovulation. And I think we can maximize that fertility. At least that's what we're hoping, right, JP? That's the idea. That's the plan. Well, remember this, like after you inseminate, the, you deposit the semen at the body of the uterus. So that semen needs to travel all the way up to the oviduct. And that's what I showed my students during during class here. It, there is a, a time that this semen needs to be tra like travel all the way to the, where the egg is going to be fertilized in the oviduct. And there's a time also that this semen needs to be capacitated. So be, be actually prepared to fertilize the egg. So all this time, needs needs to take in consideration that's why we we prefer to get the well it's optimal to get the cows the heifers and cows inseminated um around that time 12 12 to 8 hours prior to ovulation and ovulation we would time based on that asterisk okay so like paul was saying of course if the cow returns in an asterisk again like if you see a cow in heat in the morning, you, you breed them in the morning and she returns esters again. We sex semen, maybe I would I would inseminate it again, right, Paul? I don't know. What do I you think, think so on that? Too. I, I, I think with I sex semen, I would breed it again, but with conventional, I probably would not. I probably would be it would be okay unless you see her again next 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 day. Then probably I would inseminate her again. And I would hope that wouldn't happen in too many of them. Let's exactly let's let's bounce up here. Uh, Jim asked another good question. Can can you comment on using MGA to sink heifers? This is a really great question because uh, we now have some very large heifer uh, heifer custom heifer growers, and so you know when these and this and by the way, this is also a protocol that was. It was a beef protocol imported from the beef. It was world. it was it it's was imported from the beef world. And when you have, okay, when you have pens of 200 or 300 or 500 heifers, breeding age heifers, nobody wants to mess around with using all those cedars and all the treatments. 
And so what you can use is it's a, it's an orally active progesterone. MGA stands for melangestrol acetate. It's really cheap. It's you a can, synthetic progesterone. It's a synthetic basically. progesterone. You can get it from a feed mill. That's where you would get it. Mm -hmm. It costs a couple pennies per head per day to feed it. Okay. So here's, here's something you have to consider, though, if you're going to use an MGA-based protocol. You have to have enough bunk space so that all heifers in the pen eat their allotment every day. If they miss a day because they're getting crowded out, there's competition at the bunk, you're going to see all kinds of breakthrough estresses. So it's really important that if you're going to use an MGA-based program, you've got the right type of facilities. Now, JP, go through, go through the standard MGA protocol that you yeah, have some actually, experience with. with one of there is, uh, and I can show this, there is this, uh, besides the, the DCA, the, uh, DCRC, Dairy Care Reproduction Council, there is this Beef Task Reproduction Force uh, website that I'm going to actually go in here to show. It's pretty good, actually, Paul. Yeah, they have a very there. nice they have a very nice website. Uh, if any of you deal with beef cows, and while JP is looking for this, all, everybody here that's on, if you're asking questions, I think it's a lot of fun to answer questions. So anybody has anybody has any questions, keep keep shooting them at us. Here because I, I do like I do let enjoy me, trying to answer these questions. Uh, let me just share really quick my screen here. Okay, we have yeah. There you go. This is the the website and sorry, beef reproduction these. task force. So this would be a group of reproductive biologists at universities. JP and I are reproductive biologists at University of Wisconsin that we work with dairy cows. These guys all work with beef programs. So, yep, there it is. MGA. So this is the AI MGA. Program. They call the MGA PG and uh, time day I protocol. Okay. So they do a 14 days of MGA. So daily feeding with MGA in the span. Then the, the heat that comes right after that MGA. Okay. It's not good. You don't want to inseminate any poor cow fertility. that comes this poor fertility because you kept that MJ for a long time. It actually uh, made that follicle really infertile, but you you actually synchronize them. But these, these yeah, there will be an estrus. There will be an estrus right there, but don't and breathe. And then they you would wait 19 days on that day 33, give a prostaglandin, okay, and with. This is on and off in this case, just one prostaglandin here. About three days later, GnRH and artificial insemination. So, and estrus detection during that period between PG and AI. The farms that I've been working, like the large farms that I've been working with, and they are using this in a crossbred uh, Hojo heifers. And they, like Paul said, about 120 to 150 uh, pans, pans of heifers and put the MGA there and all the same, all in the same pan are gonna get it, the same feed. They don't worry about those heats here. Give the PG after they check for that heat, inseminate and generate three days later. They got close to that 60%. Uh, actually, they were getting above 60, 62% conception rate with sex semen, which was amazing. Uh, but like, you have to have enough enough animals, I guess, to 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 mix that feed. I think it's you have to have a lot of animals, I guess, to to do this pro protocol because you're gonna manage all together the same way. Um, one thing about it also, you have to have someone that with time, like a, a a feeder that has time to do that mixing too, right? So you're gonna have to use all that feed with your heifers from that particular pan. After yeah. you breed them here. You don't need to worry about heat for the next probably couple of weeks, to be honest. I would just start, and that's what they do. They start tail chalking back those animals. And that's another thing about time they eye. Most of the animals would not come in heat after that insemination. They would just, the ones that don't get pregnant, they would return in heat. But, and that's kind of like what they do. They wait 14 days to start uh, actually uh, checking heats on those animals. So it's a, it, it it also save save labor in that during that period of time after time they eye, uh, which is and it's very cheap. It's a very inexpensive protocol. Like I say, we're talking two cents per head per day to feed that MGA. So just pennies of MGA. You've got the prostaglandin, the cost of the prostaglandin, and, and the cost to administer it, and the GnRH. 
what what I've seen on some of these larger heifer growers, they've got an array of pens. They might have multiple pens of hundreds of heifers. They'll stagger such that they can synchronize certain pens, and then the repeats are set to come back into heat kind of the same time there so they can concentrate heat detection but i think you're right so so really i mean this is a really great question i think for people with smaller numbers of heifers the the cedar based five day cedar sink protocols are the way to go because you can't mess around with buying small volumes of mga and trying to feed that stuff it'd just be a disaster so smaller groups of heifers the the the, the cedar based programs if you're really large scale heifer grower those MGA based pro programs can work really well. And, you know, another, just to throw this out there, another use of MGAs in feedlot heifers just to suppress estrus. They don't want them, they don't want them in, you know, and, they want good gains. And, so they're not hopping all over each other. So they just put that in the feed and it keeps estrus and, suppressed. And, and to be honest, that's the question that I received this last week, Paul. Uh, I'll most produce, now there are several producers, small and large producers, raising beef beef heifers too. And they asked me, okay, is there any uh, any imp implant that can suppress asters? Okay, and no, we don't have any implant available, uh, label, labeled uh, market, okay? MJ yeah. you can use, but you would have to feed uh, the, the heifers daily, okay? Like yeah. Paul was saying. And that works well in a group of dairy heifers, for instance, if you want to do that, and people do that for if they raise heifers sometimes in the in a in a freestyle, they want to decrease their activity, decrease angers and things like that. They use that MGA. But when you raise beef heifers with the dairy heifers and you want to do it only with the beef heifers to so suppress the asters. The only way that I see doing it, it's like they do with beef heifers in the west, in the west side, would be to do actually to spay them. Spaying yeah. them would be the only way. Uh, and if you want to increase their growth, people use actually their uh, growth stimulant uh, implants that in beef heifers to improve even their growth too. But that's the only, I've been receiving actually questions about that, Paul, just to let you know. Yeah. Um, so you would have to ask your veterinarian, uh, contact your veterinarian to spay them. Right. Ryan, Ryan looks like a very like... overall comment. It's still a, a pharmaceutical product. You got to work with your veterinarian. You got to get the dosing right, just like any other product you would use. Correct. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And of course they, they would be, have to be involved. And in, it's not approved for, it's not approved for lactating dairy cows. So don't want to yeah. use it there. Um, so Ryan, we're getting towards uh, towards the end here. I maybe we could jump to JP. I, I want to hit that topic. And Ryan, I think one of your questions is what was one of the big questions we got on this roadshow? We um, that that meeting that we did up in Green Bay that was that was fun. It was just a fun meeting. I mean, we probably had what did we have twenty five or thirty veterinarians there, and so they. We, we really did kind of more of what we're doing now. We didn't show a lot of slides. We just had a discussion with them. But JP, the big question they had was so many farms now have bought heat detection systems. So there's lots of these act automated activity monitoring systems on the market. Anybody with robots has, you know, a NEDAP or a Laley system. Um, People are buying the cow manager. Uh, there's all different kinds of yeah, SCR, uh, my colors, former my former student Glasio is, is here actually lecturing on campus today because he he works for Merck who sells all flex and uh, and SCR. So those systems are very, very popular. And so the question is, they buy the system. Should you continue to use a fertility program at first breeding like a double op sync, which which one thing we'll admit, JP and I will both admit, it's a lot of work to do a double obsync. It's a lot of treatments. You got to keep track of which cows are getting the right stuff on the right day. It's seven treatments. Um, it's a lot. So the question was, my client has bought a heat detection system and they want to minimize minimize the shot programs. JP, what do you, what do you For think? first service. For first For insemination. First service. They want to drop, they want to drop that double obsync for first service. Just go with the heat detection system. It's basically cherry picking again, going back to the cherry picking, right, Paul? Uh, of cows in heat, we breed them. What about like, and then do something else with the. And uh, what, this was actually one of the topics that, that I, I covered during the Reaper Old show. And I went back on time and showed why we do 
the fertility treatments the way you do we do so we went back on time i went back on time and showed how fertility how we change it all the hormonal environment hormonal environment of the cow and making sure she has to she ovulates on the right time to get inseminated on the right time for the time they eye and how that follicle that will be the ovulatory follicle that will ovulate the egg that we are we are trying to get fertilized how that program will improve the fertility of that follicle okay so that was the key of my of my talk and i actually I, do you think it would be worth it to show that graph paul on on, on progesterone and everything showing how we you actually could you could bring that up and the thing i want to reiterate yeah jp you spent a, a good chunk of your talk kind of going through the physiology of fertility programs and i think i think the thing that people don't think about with fertility programs is they are fertility programs. Uh, we've got a couple of different studies that we've published. When you compare uh, breeding high producing lactating dairy cows to an estrus versus putting them on a fertility program like a double off sync program, you, the advantage, there's two big advantages. Number one, you, you inseminate all cows within seven days of the end of the voluntary waiting period when they're on. And it is very program. similar to, to the thing that we're talking about heifers, right? It's Paul? exactly it's, the same concept. You get semen, it, you need semen. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the first step to getting a cow pregnant is putting semen into her. And you take that step quicker and with all animals with a time to AI program. That's number one. But number two, you're going to get about eight or about 10 percentage points higher fertility. Conception so if rate. you get if you get 35, usually people get about 35% conception rate. Or 40, and, maybe we'll say 40. Yeah, let's say 40. 40 and uh, with using uh, just an asterisk activity monitor. And with the fertility treatment like double off sync or G6G, you can get up 50. to 50 to 55 in, in, in pretty pairs. And, and in if you pair, a, a thing I want to get in here, JP, if the latest experiment that my PhD student Megan Lauber did if you pair a fertility program like a double ob sync with sex semen in first lactation animals, we oh, did this study geez, in Jersey. I mean, because you control the timing of insemination relative to ovulation better in those programs, you can get much better fertility with sex semen. So, I mean, basically what we told those veterinarians in that scenario, I said, look, if I'm using sex semen in my lactating dairy cows, I'm coming off of a fertility program. There's too many advantages to that fertility program for preg rate, for service rate, for conception rate, for optimizing use of sex semen, all those reasons I would say, and then use the heat detection system. Well, first of all, people love the rumination part. You know, with, with that rumination detection, it, it has transformed transition cow management. Wouldn't you say, JP? Yeah. It, I mean, it, because it really did. It saves time, saves time from getting cows identified the 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 sick cows identified so you save time uh locking time of those in the transition pan right in that yeah i mean it used pan, to be it used to be you'd have a crew of three people going through those post fresh cows temping them room and motility looking at them doing all those kinds of things people with these systems now with these with these rumination systems you just look at minutes of rumination and you can see the cows that need to be drenched you, you can see the cows that need to be paid attention to so I'm not saying that the, the heat detection systems combined with the rumination are not good systems. They're great systems. There's just too many advantages for first service with a timed AI. And then after first timed AI, the earliest non-pregnancy diagnosis you can do for the cows that don't conceive is catching those cows coming back into heat. And so I think our big message is, look, yeah, you can combine those two systems. Um, we got a couple questions here. Well, uh, one... do you want to cover that or let me let me let me just say one thing. So first, like Paul said, just recap, you're not going to get all the cows inseminated if you do that. You're going to cherry pick them. Yeah. So any good systems, you get about 75 to 8. It's I, I doubt you're going to you're going to get close to 80 if you have a good system inseminated in heat. Second one. So you don't get 100 percent. Second, you decrease the conception rate of that first service. So if you're using sex semen, you're going to have to rebreed more cows and you're going to have a higher cost with that too. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you're going to have a high cost with sex semen and with a, a fertility treatment, you can get 
over over probably fifty percent or over of consumption rate. Uh, yeah. if you have a good a good farm, a good management, and everything, uh, uh, pregnant, uh, just with that insemination. So you get rid of fifty percent of the cows that you need to watch for heat. Exactly, and right. you have to deal with fear. Yeah, so we got we got some good questions here, JP. Okay. Let's um, do it. Perkins says, is there any extra benefit of using fertility programs like double obstinc in heifers? In Pakistan, <laughs> farmers are using double obstinc in heifers. Okay. My answer to that is no. Okay. Because, because a double obstinc program was specifically designed to correct the physiology problems in lactating dairy cows, which is very different than a non-lactating heifer. A double obstinc program in heifers would be complete overkill. I wouldn't do it. You agree with that, JP? I agree. I okay. agree. Uh, they're, don't, they're not, you don't need good, that. Yeah, there are good programs. There are good programs already that sh are shorter yeah. and for heifers and don't require just, as many. You wouldn't want to do double obstinc in a beef cow. Yeah, no. The, the physiology of a beef cow is very different. And in fact, GnRH based programs, most beef protocols have progesterone in them because they're not cycling in a different way than lactating dairy cows. We don't want to get into that. Okay. How early can I start double obstinc in my cows to reduce voluntary waiting period without affecting conception rates negatively? I don't think this is a conception rate question as much as it is a optimal timing of pregnancy. And so what I see with the optimal voluntary waiting period is somewhere in the 70 to 80 day range at first time insemination. And actually, for kind in the high the, producing lactating dairy cows. In high producing oh. lactating dairy cows. I don't know about yeah. Pakistan, but in high yeah. producing lactating dairy cows for sure. The questions we've been getting is because we've gotten so good with fertility, people are asking the question, well, I'm, I'm drying off cows given a lot of milk, which is going to happen if you have really good preg rates, right? And, and so they're asking in high, high, really high producing lactating dairy. dairy cows. So the question is, should we increase that voluntary waiting period maybe to 90 or even 100 days? And the answer was modeled by a guy at, uh, at Alanco, uh, Kevin Duvetter. And basically, you don't want to do that because all you do by increasing the voluntary waiting period is you buy more days of low milk production at the end of lactation. Okay. Furquay, I would not go too early with a double obstinc program. Uh, I know what you're saying, but again, I think that 60 to 70 days is where we want to be. And then the I, third I guess question. You, well, I guess if you want to reduce the length of the program, you can you can do a G6G, okay? Yeah. Uh, that would be, um, uh, I think eight about eight days, um, less than than a double obviously some somewhere there, right? Yeah. Paul, about eight to ten days. Uh, so G6G would probably work better in yeah. this case. Uh, and you can read them earlier. You uh, could if that's what you wanted to do. If you don't have high producing if, cows, if you have a low producing cow, yeah. Okay, um, Mark, Mark asks a great one, question. One, one thing, oh, one thing before about the double of sync that he asked about heifers. We are working, if you're worried about using cedars because they are expensive, we are working on doing a program, a timed AI program, um, and optimizing that doesn't uh, require cedar, okay? Yeah. But, the heifers, but that heifers, uh, that those heifers may, may need to be cycling. I'm not sure how is the nutrition condition of those heifers in Pakistan too. Okay, yeah. so that's something that you need to worry about. And I we don't, don't have, have that problem in our U.S. heifers. They're going to cycle at nine months. They are. We don't have it. Yeah, it's not it's, like beef heifers that have a cyclicity it, problem. You get yeah. about most farms. You get almost 100 percent of heifers uh, cycling at that stage. Okay, about about 11, 12 months, you already have almost 100 percent. You're going to have probably five percent or less that's not cycling with issues. Okay. So Mark asked, do you have a voluntary waiting period in mind for first service from heat detection? Ooh. Okay, so, so again, this is a really great question and it, it, it goes right in with what I tell people. The voluntary waiting period is gonna depend on your strategy for first service. Okay, so if you're gonna use 100% timed AI off of a timed AI program like a double off sync, you wanna be in that 70 to 80 day range for first service. You need that much time just to fit the protocol in. If you're going to start with a heat detection, and what herds will do is a pre-sync obsync, for example, a couple prostaglandins, you can breed the esters off of those. I would say you've got to be in the in the 60 day in milk range there. Don't you think, JP? 50, 60 days for first yes. service because you need more time uh, to, to allow those cows to show that estrus. You're not forcing the issue. 
and then, then and, and to be honest that's what they're they're do like here some some of scientists are researchers that we know oh, yeah. are actually comparing double of sync to to cherry picking programs okay which yeah. or they say they call it target target reproductive management strategies sure uh, and so if you're they... going to breed to estrosol for the first time you want to be at 50 60 day voluntary waiting period because you have to start earlier especially now, the multiparous cows especially the multiparous cows and here's what i will argue though you can make an argument that you're really high producing cows you don't want pregnant that early mm -hmm. it may not be the optimal time but but because you're waiting for them to show estrus and you give them 21 day cycles to show estrus, you got to start earlier. Um, at some point, and this is another point that I want to make regarding Mark's question, you'll never catch all of your cows in heat. Okay. We know that about 25%, somewhere between 20 and 30% of our high producing lactating dairy cows are not cycling. They don't return to cyclicity after calving by 60 days in milk. OK, so I don't care what system you have in place. I don't care how well you heat detect the number I use based on data from our lab, from other people. You'll catch maybe 75 percent of those cows in estrus if you watch them in a, and in the a rest good, of in them a, in, in a, a good, good well-managed herd with. Yeah, with good places for the cows to show heat detection with good heat detection. And so it makes a lot of sense then to give those cows a certain number of days to show an estrus. But when, when they hit a certain drop dead point, I don't know what that is, 80, 90 days in milk, put them on a time to eye program and get the, that last group of cows. Uh, well, and, I, and I, I, I rephrase that. I, I just want to make sure that a well-managed because uh, anovular cows will increase if you have more uh, problems with uh, health issues like peripartum oh, yeah. disease. So if you have a, a herd with a high incidence of peripartum disease, you're going to have more anovular cows which are not going to show esters, okay? And the nice, the, be the beauty of this, this program such as Double Off Sync is that these programs use several injections of GRH which which are going to return those cows in cyclicity. So yeah. they sometimes can mask some uh, mask some issues with actually your uh, transition period problems, okay? And that's kind of, kind of like why a lot of people use it. So uh, because it actually can improve fertility, even cows that are not cycling. Yeah. And and that's, that's the beauty of that program. All right, Ryan, we're kind of up against the clock here. Yeah, Don't I was going to show that great. slide, but... Uh, it's but been I, a good think... it's been a it's been a great discussion jp it's been a lot of fun i'm i'm really glad that uh some of the uh people online uh jumped in with some questions it's always fun to talk about stuff people are interested in yeah thanks jim it was good oh. to have jim yep here. yep this was very good and we're gonna have to do version 2.0 of this we could keep going um the, paul this is something i've heard you say in other spaces but maybe it's a good way to wrap up we can get really t um, into voluntary waiting period sex semen using beef semen but we got to look at the bigger picture the fertility's got to be there you talk yeah. about the reproduction revolution that's what opened the door to these things we can't lose sight of that that um you just got to do the good management things. And if you do run into trouble, work with your veterinarian, work with one of these guys to troubleshoot it so you can yep. open those doors. And I think if I can rephrase what you're saying there, uh, Ryan, I, I show reproductive technologies as a pyramid. And the base of the pyramid is good repro. OK, if you don't have that base in place, all these other technologies that we use are based on the good repro. So use of sex and beef semen, genomic testing. You don't need to do genomic testing if you don't have good fertility because you have to keep all the heifers that you raise, right? Uh, sex and beef semen and use of IVF embryo transfer. All those technologies sit right on top of good repro. If, you, if we go away from the things that have made us successful with good repro, that whole pyramid collapses in on itself and we don't get to take advantage of these other technologies. So they're kind of stacked. I guess I would say those technologies are. Perfect. I'm actually going to paste my contact information in the webinar chat. So if you have uh, additional questions or want to get in touch, uh, feel free to just shoot me an email. Jim says he likes our format. I like that. Um, I'm glad because we wanted to try, you know, there's too many. I think you can get bogged down in showing a lot of uh, slides and a lot of data. I think people like to kind of hear a discussion. So that's great. Good feedback. Thanks. 
Well, actually, we got another on yeah, a farm activity question. monitoring yep. device is being used. According to recommendations, the program for timing of AI being done. Heifers and cows are being inseminated. However, we're getting good results in cows, but not in heifers hmm. with a heat detection system. Mm. Well, well I believe they, he question. probably, I believe maybe he's using sex semen on those heifers and not, and maybe conventional semen in the cows, and that may be Could a different be. on the time of insemination. Um, sometimes um, it would be good to clarify that, but, and probably that's the case if you, if you uh, disseminate those animals, run the list twice a day and see if that helps, right, Paul? I think yep. that maybe it's one of I the recommendations so. that came early on. Yeah, so, that that's a really good point. It could be the the case. So, JP, right. fun stuff. Ryan, thanks for moderating, and uh, we'll have to do this again. Yes, thank you both guys. Very greatly appreciate it. Uh, and again, April through Tuesday of the month, we'll be right back here again. Uh, taking a different spin, talking about heifers again, but uh, this time we're on the uh, raising them and grazing aspects. So thanks again. Greatly appreciate it. You bet. Hey, thanks.